I would like to talk about the Ebbinghauser forgetting curve, which is, it seems, has been widely used and in a nonsense kind of way. So if you have listened to stuff like this before, Basically, the reason why it works is because of something called the forgetting curve, and that's something that's been around in the psychology literature since the 1800s, and that's something that we can all probably intuitively experience for ourselves. Um, you've probably had that feeling whereby, you know, you revise a th something and then you look at it a week later and it's like you've just forgotten all of it. So like, what was the point of revising that? And you have to repeat it, repeat, repeat again. That's the forgetting curve in action. It's the idea that over time we forget things at an exponential rate. In this video, I would like to show you what's really behind Ebbinghauser forgetting curve. I will do this by looking at the actual research PhD thesis from Ebbinghauser and what he was looking at. But don't worry, if you were never read a research paper, I will explain to you. I am Karen. I have a PhD in physics, so I know how to write papers. I wrote papers before and I know what to look for in them. Because there's a lot of stuff out there in contrast to what most people think. Not just because there's a paper out there doesn't mean it's a good paper. You need to be very critical when you read papers. And I'm going to show you what you have to look for. When we look at the forgetting curve, I will also talk about a different perspective of how you can improve the way you learn in a much more efficient and fun way. I'm now looking at the thesis that is online from Ebbinghauser. And this is the English version. It's actually easier for me to do it in German. Also because the translation is kind of weird. I guess that the scientific English makes it harder. But I just guess it's more um, useful <laughs> if I start directly in English and then explain more in English. So when you look at research, the most important thing is to ask how they measured it, what they did test. Because maybe what they tested is not at all close to the situation that you are facing. So because it's a PhD thesis, it's a lot more material to read. And I will just skip ahead to the section with the method of investigation. Um, so, chapter 3, method of investigation, section 11, series of nonsense syllables. Nonsense? I thought we wanted to be uh, brilliant and smart and have a lot of knowledge and not just nonsense in our head. The paragraph starts with, in order to test practically, although only for a limited field, a way of penetrating more deeply into memory processes, and it is to these that the proceeding considerations have been directed, I have hit upon the following method. So he already says that is a limited field and he chooses this because of the process or the measurement technique he is using. Out of simple consonants of the alphabet and our 11 vowels and diphthongs, I don't really know how to pronounce this kind of stuff, all possible syllables of a certain sort were constructed. A vowel sound, sound being placed between two consonants. These syllables, about 2,300 in number, were mixed together and then drawn out of chance. Then he goes on in that a certain number of syllables of this random words. Basically, he made up words out of the syllables. And then he goes on a little bit about how, to, how he considered when it was learned that you were able to immediately recall it, reproduce it aloud afterwards. Section 12. Advantages of the material. The nonsense material just described offers many advantages, in part because of this very lack of meaning. Yeah, actually, I, I really like meaning because I like meaningful stuff. First of all, it is relatively simple and relatively homogeneous. In the case of the material nearest at hand, namely poetry or prose, the content is now narrative in style, now descriptive or now reflective. It contains now a phrase that is pathetic, now one that is humorous. Its metaphors are sometimes beautiful, sometimes harsh. Its rhythm is sometimes smooth and sometimes rough. There is thus brought into play a multiplicity of influences which change without regularity and are therefore disturbing. What he's saying is meaning is annoying to him as the person who is doing the research because it messes up his statistics. Because changes without regularity, he cannot get re reproducible results and disturbing him. Such are associations. This is a very good thing for learning but annoying for him in his research, which darts here and there. Different degrees of interest, lines of verse recalled because of their striking quality or their beauty and the liking. All this is avoidable with our syllables. 
Among many thousand combinations, there occur scarcely a few dozen that have meaning. And among these, there are again only a few whose meaning was realized while they are being memorized. In order to get these nice statistics that I, can, that I could show you now, but it's really not that interesting, he made the experiment in a way that he get very consistent and interesting results, if you like interesting rather than usable. But the interesting, I mean, for me, the interesting thing is what exceptions he's actually calling, he's talking about. The fact that some of these phrases are pathetic, humorous, metaphors, sometimes beautiful, sometimes harsh. Because whenever you see, whenever you read something that creates emotion in you, it's so much easier to memorize, uh, to learn, to because it has suddenly has meaning to you, you can relate to it and you can store it in your in your um, memory, in your brain. This is stuff that your brain really likes. It's the same with these associations. The new material you can associate, you can link to what you already know. And that's it's like a magnet drawing the information into and store it, dock it to what you already have. This all depends on your interest. The more interest, the more easy it is for you to memorize. When we look now at the Ebbinghauer research, it's very limited to nonsense. For example, if you are, if you have to memorize your phone number or the number for the ATM for your cards. In order to make these kind of learning these kind of numbers more easy, there are strategies in mnemonic, mnemonic. And what do they do? They basically trick you and give, giving to random numbers meaning of associating each number with a certain word and then making a little story that is funny, that is um, awkward, that is scary. Again, making it more meaningful. Nonsense becomes meaningful. That's the whole thing about mnemonic. All of these tricks are usually about creating a story, some relationship of the stuff. A more important thing when you read research is being critical and questioning. That's the best thing that's mandatory in order to uh, be able to problem solve, to uh, be the knows it all in the group, to be the smartest person. Always question, always think of if you actually believe this or not. For example, when we say, or oh, everything, when you learn something, it's normal, you always forget it. After a week, you forget it. Everything? Really. Because if a certain event has a strong influence on, on you, like when you were in school and you had to, uh, I don't know, say something and everybody was laughing about you. How often did they have to laugh about you for you to remember that this is an uncomfortable situation? Once. Because it was really meaningful you, to you. You don't have to repeat this. The same is true for when you hurt yourself and you touch, as a child, when you touch the hot stove and you burn your hand. How often do you need to do this in order to learn it? Every day, like the whole process of, um, the whole strategy of spaced repetition. Do you really need to space repetition, train your child in order to not let it touch the, the hot stove again? No. One time and it learned because it's such a big effect. It has such a big meaning. So now you hopefully get a little bit of a sense of why the forgetting curve from Ebbinghaus is actually nonsense, relating to nonsense, which brings us to the question of how do we make something hard to learn easy. An interesting case where people have problems to learn, like in school, but then they get sick and the medical name of their sickness is really complicated and long and all the medicine that they are taking, all the symptoms, all the relationships, and they have no problem learning this stuff. Why? Because it's, it's super important to their, uh, to their well-being. The same as if you have a friend who is very sick or a parent. It has meaning to you. Now, some of the, for example, medical students, when they go through all of this, when they study, you might get fake symptoms and feeling all the symptoms, which on one hand is good because you're getting a relationship to the situation of the patient, but it's probably not really healthy. Another way of doing this is maybe sounding a little bit strange. Let's imagine we are not making our own family sick, but our imaginary family sick. You can also take a um, TV series or a superhero family and you have all you have a relationship to them because they're your imaginary family or you're looking up to this TV series characters. And now you give each of these characters a disease. Suddenly it's relative to you, but you don't feel sick. And you can just see all the symptoms and all the relationship, uh, what they go through, how, to in how they interact and how you can make them feel better with, with medicine. So then suddenly it's getting really important for you to learn all this stuff. You can do similar things with lore. You can make your imaginary family or friends sue each other 
about basically everything that you want to study about, play all these processes through in your mind. In physics, we have actually a um, term, which is, it's actually a German one, obviously. So lots of German influence there. It's Gedanken experiment, mind experiments. A lot of the stuff that is related to um, relativity, what Einstein did, like the twin paradox, I don't know how to translate this. The twin paradox is a mind experiment. And the idea behind this one is you cannot really do this experiment because it takes too long and it's practically impossible kind of right now. So the idea is you have two twins, but well, they have a pair of twins. And one of them you send on a um, travel in a spacecraft with very high velocity, close to um, lightning speed. And the other twin stays on the earth. So with a very low velocity. One of the things in, relative, in the relativity theory is that time changes depending on the speed you're traveling with, you're moving with. And the faster you go, the slower time goes. Which means that in this thought experiment, conducting experiment, the twin that is in the spacecraft, his time goes much slower. After for him five years, he comes back, but his twin, who has a different, who had a different speed, experienced a different time, and for him, time was flying, was going by faster. So one of these twins is much older than the other one. This thought experiment is probably not really applicable, but it is a really nice use case for relativity for the stuff you found, for the equations that seem meaningless and seamlessly random garbage from nerds becomes quite interesting for a sci-fi sci movie suddenly. Or maybe it's probably a little bit boring as a sci-fi movie. Or not. I hope I could convince you to expand on the way you think a little bit more. Also be more optimistic about learning because it doesn't need to be hard if you think of it in a different way. If it's meaningful, it's fun, If you, because then you're really getting something out, for, out of it, you're understanding something about it. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like. I try to keep my nerd level, Sheldon level on a decent level because I don't want to insult everybody. I can do this very easily because there's some idea of different student backgrounds. And one of them from, because I studied physics, we had the medical students in my university had to do some physics experiments. And they also had to do, maybe they got a little bit tortured, but we, I just want to, because we want to have good doctors. Not because of that, we also got tortured, so it's just, just fair. And there are cases where medical students in the physics exam and the oral exams basically know the whole physics books by heart, word by word. They pass because they say the right things. It's not a good thing to just learn everything by heart. Like it's nonsense. It should be meaningful to you because I want you to be able to use this information. When you have a patient, when I'm your patient, I want you to, I really want you to be the smartest doctor that I can find. My life might depend on it, which is not why I do these uh, videos, but maybe it comes handy in a the, in the later point. Until then, have fun learning and become the smartest version of yourself.